six, five, four, three, two, one. The History with Jackson podcast. Hello and welcome back to the History with Jackson podcast. Today on the podcast, we are speaking to Joshua Proven. He's back to talk all about his brand new book with Helion, Every Hazard and Fatigue, The Siege of Pensacola, 1781. Now I'm really excited to get into this episode of you. I'm really excited to share with you some of the history on this fascinating siege in American history. But if you want to learn more history, read more history, learn about different areas of history that we're not covering on the podcast because we cannot possibly cover everything on the podcast, head to the History of Jackson blog on the History of Jackson website. The link is in the description below if you catch up on a wide variety of history from so many different authors, some of your favourite guests on the podcast and others. Now, without further ado, let's head to Josh. So hello and welcome back to History of Jackson. Today, we welcome back historian and author Josh Proven to talk about his brand new book with Helion. Thank you, Helion, for sending it to me. Every Hazard and Fatigue, The Siege of Pensacola, 1781. I just received my copy in the mail yesterday, so I'm very excited to talk about it. How are you doing, Josh? I'm doing really well, Jackson. Thanks for having me back on the show, and um, thanks for, for the interest in the book. Uh, no worries, mate. No worries, mate. I, I love looking at military history, revolution history, political history, and I think this has a little bit of everything, so I'm excited to talk to you about it. But the first question I want to ask you, like I, I've asked you a couple of times before, and I ask all the guests, what's the inspiration behind writing this book? The, the inspiration uh, comes from a few places. Like with a lot of the stuff I've written, it uh, is sort of a cumulative build-up over the years. Uh, my family have spent quite a long time intermittently in the United States and in uh, the South specifically, and... Uh, that so I've been to Pensacola a few times, and I'd, I've seen what there is to see there of the uh, the remains of his, this part of historic Pensacola. Um, and then, uh, as we do sometimes, we we are on the internet and we see a picture, and we wonder what it is. And I saw one of David Rowland's paintings of, uh, and this was of the Royal, Royal Artillery of Captain Johnson's battery at Siege of Pensacola. And it was just that it was the Royal Artillery at Pensacola. And I was like, I know that place, what's going on here? Uh, so I looked into it a bit, let it, let it lie, moved on with my life. Interesting, there was, a, there was a battle in Pensacola. That's interesting, so I move on. And then uh, on Twitter uh, around 20, but sometime between 2012 and 2017, I would guess, uh, a friend, a good friend of mine, Chaz Mayner, uh, became the historian in residence at Colonial Williamsburg. And he did an impression of a general named Bernardo de Galvez. And, this, and he talked a lot about the Spanish and the American Revolution. He did a Twitter live tweet when that was the cool thing um, about... Uh, the siege of Pensacola, and that was where the germ began. And then in 2020, when I was uh, I was fed up, I, I was fed up. A lot of my book proposals come when I'm fed up. Uh, when I was fed up of the, like I'd, I'd I'd sent off my other book, and I was wondering what I was going to do for the next forever. How long they kept us locked indoors? Um, I was thinking, okay, well I'm just gonna I'm just gonna throw this at Helian. Siege of Pensacola, uh, partly because out of curiosity, I had Googled the word Pensacola in the National Archives. And I should, yeah, and this is, an, this is another thing. I will generally randomly look around at sources. And if I find a big clatch of them, I say, that's a book, I can write that. And I found ridiculous amounts of entries in the National Archives Discovery Catalog for British headquarters correspondence and colonial office correspondence. Uh, that dealt with Pensacola. So I was like, okay, we can do this. Uh, so I asked them if they wanted me to. They said yes, and here we are. I think that's a really nice way as a historian, tracking that through years of interest, but also just just asking the National Archive, you know, how many sources you got on this? I think that's a really nice way. But 
I think we're looking at Pensacola now. You've alluded to it's the South America, South of America, but where is it, and and why is it important enough place to fight over? That can, I mean, that's an excellent question. Whenever there's some sort of military event, why are we fighting over this piece of dirt? Why are people dying for it? And there's a deeper question there that we don't have time to go into. And my anti-war side is going to come out if we do. So we're just going to go into geography now. Um, the uh, Pensacola is about 200 miles east of New Orleans. It sits on a map between New Orleans and the state capital of Florida and Tallahassee. And it is one of the larger bays of the Gulf of Mexico, about the, Gulf, the Bay of Pensacola. Uh, from, from, e- from, from west to east, it's the, you have New Orleans, you have the mouth of the Mississippi, you have Mobile, Alabama, you, you have modern Alabama, I should say, and you have Pensacola. And then, and, and these bays are important for the British because they are possible British versions of New Orleans. And they're important to the Spanish for the same reason. They don't want a big commercial rival port on the Gulf of Mexico, which used to be a Spanish-owned monopoly back before what is called East Florida, no, West Florida, was um, ca- was uh, handed over to the British at the end of the Seven Years' War. In 1781, it's important because it's the last piece of British West Florida left in control of the British after the successful Gulf Coast campaign of Bernardo de Galvez uh, between 1779 and 1780. And for those wondering, West Florida is a weird thing, a weird entity that the British, uh, of the British Empire, it's a territory that exists but existed between the Mississippi, the uh, western border of Georgia, and a line sort of approximate to the line of the northern border of, I'm going to say Louisiana, but it doesn't exist anymore. It, it's, it, today, it, it spans Florida, Louisiana, Alabama, and Mississippi. And that, that's, a, that's a huge amount of land there for, for the British to be trying to control and, and trying t- to look after um, militarily as well. So at this at this point, you know, we have the American Revolution, the British and the American people at that point are, are fighting over American independence. And a player that we te- tend to forget about, ignore within this conflict are the Spanish. You know, what was the Spanish position and attitude towards the American Revolution? It's it's a very interesting question and another, and another very big subject, actually. Um, the... It's fascinating to see how they got involved, the characters and the characters involved in it, the politics that surrounded it, the diplomacy. It's probably more interesting than the fighting, to be honest. But the to simplify it, the Spanish already have their version of America. Uh, they have an American empire. They call it the Indies. It exists from it, it was it's it's enormous. They are the largest colonial power in the Americas. And so, yes, they are going to be interested in the fact that the British are having this this problem, this civil this civil war, so to speak, as far as they're concerned, uh, in the in in what is now the United States, uh, because the British, after the French were kicked out, are the only other rival power there in the Americas. However, due to their experiences as an ally of the French in the Seven Years' War, the Spanish are not at all in any hurry to rush in on the side of their French allies uh, when they get involved in 1778, officially. And they, 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 um, they content themselves with supplying the Americans as a neutral power with whatever they want to pay for, pretty much, at good prices, at affordable prices. They, they essentially clothe certain sections of the Continental Army the but the most um the, the biggest thing that is of interest to congress in terms of uh, getting the spanish involved is their fleet and their money because the american dollar 
continental currency is worthless and they need constant influxes of um, hard specie to keep afloat. The Spanish have a lot of that and very close by in, the, in New Spain and uh, various other mines throughout South America. Now, the Spanish are know that the French want them to get involved because the French are a bit cash-strapped too, which is something, obviously, that you get into realizing when you start studying the road to the French Revolution, the massive amount of money that they spent on financing the fleet and the army that had to go to America has a big part to play in that. And they just didn't have the liquidity to do this on their own for an extended amount of time, as we'll see. And the Spanish suddenly found themselves actually as sort of like the, the pretty girl at the party. Everybody wanted to dance with them. And at that time, the Spanish uh, chief minister was a gentleman by the name of the Conde de Flore de Blancla. And he, he played it expertly. He, he made sure Spain was ready. He kept everybody dancing. He, he even got the British to dangle Gibraltar for half a second to keep the Spanish out of the war. Um, but of course they weren't going to do that. So the Spanish did eventually and declare war. Uh, and like I say, it's a fascinating thing. Ge the ge geopolitical, geopolitically speaking, you, you're looking at some, uh, you're looking at, uh, at an, an event, di diplomatic and political event, that suggests the British are basically at this point willing to gamble the colonies in order to ensure the defense of Gibraltar. Because when the Spanish come in, that is disastrous for the American garrison, basically. Congress is overjoyed that the Spanish are going to come into the war. But this is tempered by the fact the Spanish are not the allies of the United States. This is a very clear message to Congress and to the French. Carlos III is allied with the French, with his Bourbon uh, relative on the French throne. He is not allied to the allies of the French. There's a string connecting them, but the string is not tied. It's held by the French in the middle. And the conditions for ending the war are wholly Spanish. The Spanish say, this is what we will do jointly to end the war. And we cannot stop the war unless we both agree that this is going to happen. And the United States is essentially cut out of the decision. So a bonus for the United States, they are going to get some sort of treaty that uh, ensures their independence because there are two massive European uh, maritime powers supporting them now. What that's going to look like, nobody knows, but it's going to be something. And... Now, the British have to divert resources on a much larger scale. But the Spanish are not interested in encouraging revolutions in America, and so they remain neutral through the entire war. It's interesting to see how you know, a lot of that comes down to, to finances and trying to maintain the balance of power within Europe between Spain, France and Britain. And, and 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 colonial and imperial interests uh, are definitely playing out within Spain's role and, and Spain's attempt to to negotiate through this. But within your book, you mention uh, again, we've already touched on it. Well, you mentioned a figure called Bernardo de Galvez. My Spanish isn't anywhere near as good good as yours, but I think it's important to build context uh, around him. So why is he, or who is he, and why is he such an important figure within the siege of Pensacola? Uh, Bernardo de Galvez was someone that the British were not expecting to appear on their flank. Let's put it that way. He is, to a British 18th century mind, the worst possible type of Spaniard. He has a sort of conquistador grit to him that is very dangerous when let loose in a frontier and where he can do anything he wants. So backtracking... He, this, this sort of last of the Mohicans sort of character who quite frankly, who, whose life quite frankly is, is, in, is an embarrassment to talk about because it just doesn't sound real. Um, 
he was born to a well-connected aristocratic family in Andalusia uh, in the 1740s. And he had, he was a career soldier from, uh, since he was a teenager. He knew his business back to front. He'd studied in France. He'd gone to war in North Africa. He'd fought uh, Apaches and Comanches uh, on the frontier of New Spain. He was an incredibly experienced soldier and, and a, a very audacious one. His connections were extremely good, and this helped his sort of hot-headed development made him feel somewhat invincible in the things he did because his uncle was a man named Jose de Galvez and he is the Minister of the Indies Minister of the Council of the Indies I should say, sorry, we had a little rocky problem there with the computer uh, and the uh, and that means he he what he says goes in terms of colonial policy and naturally, he looks out for his nephew and gets him nice jobs and things like that, puts him on the staffs of people. People want to be friendly to him and give him a hand and so he can tell his uncle that uh, so this guy helped me. Uh, and uh, at about the time the American Revolution is getting really interesting for France in 1777, he becomes governor of Louisiana. And, it's, and he immediately sees potential here to attack British possessions along the Gulf Coast and restore it to its former Spanish monopoly. Uh, also understanding and making it very clear that if he is attacked first, then he will not be able to defend New Orleans. It's interesting to see some things that happen today and, and happen throughout that world are still present, such as the Galvez being supported by his by his uncle and and that helping to create an atmosphere in which he feels that he can he can get away with what he wants and he can act as that that modern or modern in the sense of what we're talking about here uh, conquistador. Now his opposite number, you know, who was his opposite number, and how did they prepare for Galvez? Because he's saying he sounds and seems like a, a terrifying character to have coming towards your territories. The, the British did, had no answer for Galvez, that much is certain, and he wasn't as scary as the conquistadors. He wasn't he wasn't a monster like Pizarro, I should make this clear. He was actually an enlightened gentleman and he he was he's a very heroic, romantic character at the same time as being a very impressive soldier. Which again is why it's so difficult to be able to talk about him with any authority, because it just sounds like you're making stuff up. But his opponent is the uh, military governor, commander in chief of West Florida, uh, a, ge a general, a major general by the name of John Campbell, and he is in his fifties. He's a very opposite character to Galvez. He's a, he's quite a typical British senior officer. Uh, he's he was he was a young man when Galvez was born. He served at Culloden in the seven year, uh, War of the Austrian Succession, Seven Years' War, and now he's a major general, m pretty much at the end of his career, realistically. He gets given this he gets given this awful assignment to take reinforcements and take command of the garrison in West Florida, which is just an awful place in the 18th century. Nobody likes it. Um, and he later says it, it was uh, like uh, an ill-starred corner of His Majesty's possessions, uh, and it was unfortunate he got sent there. Um, he's n not as decisive as Galvez. He's not as well connected as Galvez. Uh, he's out in the middle of nowhere. Nobody really knows the stuff he's facing. He's underfunded. He doesn't have a lot of men. And he has very little support from Jamaica, which is where most of West Florida gets its supplies from. So his his task is monumental, especially when war breaks out, because it get, Galvez gets the drop on him, and he has trouble regaining any sort of initiative. But when he is given a clear objective, he's quite a stolid and principled officer. So by no means an idiot. He certainly seems like he knows the task that's ahead of him uh, within your writing, you know, pointing out that he, he knows that he has to prepare and he has to prepare his troops. How 
how does that come to fruition, that preparation? So there's, there's two things to bear in mind with Campbell's defense of West Florida. The first is that he is not prepared to be attacked. He's prepared, uh, in 1779, he's preparing to attack New Orleans. He's been given orders from the government to take New Orleans uh, whenever war breaks out. Unfortunately, Galvez gets word of war breaking out before Campbell does and attacks. So, and, and Campbell moves very slowly to respond to it, which draws criticism from officers of his garrison who think that it's absurd that like, a third of the garrison and a third of the colony territory should be lost before the commander in chief even hears about it, even knows what's happening, which is exactly what happened. Now, this refers to Galvez's 1779 lightning campaign along the Mississippi, where he took Natchez, Baton Rouge, uh, and um, well, pretty much all all of Florida on the Mississippi, as some people call it. And Campbell correctly guessed that he would come for Mobile for next, Mobile Bay. Um, however, he didn't really try and reinforce it very much. He's, I, don't, I can't find evidence for this, but I get the distinct impression that he, he felt he did not have the funds to hold Mobile, and for some reason felt that it was a poorer place to defend than Pensacola was. And so he left Mobile a bit out to dry, to be honest. In 1780, Galvez appears and comes within inches of utter disaster because his fleet gets wrecked when he tries to cross Mobile Bar and enter the, enter the heart anchorage. And they get shipwrecked, essentially. And they could have been surrounded very simply by the garrison and a reinforce, uh, uh, if, if, and the garrison and any sort of relief force that Campbell might have sent. But Campbell didn't send a relief force until Galvez had been able to recover and actually attack Mobile. So he gets criticized for being quite slow. Uh, however, there's an argument to be made that he did not prioritize defending the rest of West Florida because he knew eventually the Spanish would have to attack Pensacola. So why don't I just really fortify Pensacola as much as possible. And if that's what he wanted to do, and unfortunately I don't have any letter or anything saying that that's my plan, otherwise it would be very a very foresighted strategy. Uh, he he does this essentially. This is, this is essentially what he does. He builds a lot of forts that guard Pensacola and tries to build forts to guard the harbor entrance. And at the same time, using the British Indian Agency to haul in thousands of warriors to bolster the garrison. And in, in the meantime, he does beg, he, he writes begging letters to Jamaica for ships, uh, which are the thing he really needs. He really needs warships to protect his, his, his harbors and for fresh troops because the garrison of Pensacola is not fresh. They've been there since 1779 and before, and they are, They've been racked by disease, the climate, uh, and some enemy action. A lot of prisoners are taken between 1779 and 1780, which reduces some regiments down to company size. Uh, so he, he's trying his best, and he is actually putting together a decent, uh, a decent defense for what he knows is eventually going to come. It's kind of indicative of what, what he says... Pensacola is, you know, that that weird remote part on the edge of the King's Empire. Um, you know, the way the way that those letters are responded to or, or forgotten about or not responded to does kind of uh support the fact that Campbell feels like he's on the edge of of the Empire. Now, talking about letters, do do the British and the Spanish, Campbell and de Galvez, communicate during this the siege and, and these and this conflict quite quite constantly uh, uh, actually even before war broke out when they were all supposed to be neutral the governor galvez and, and even previous spanish governors to be honest uh, were writing letters to british governors and commanders in chiefs there was a 
fairly constant stream of communication between Louisiana and West Florida. And when Galvez opens his campaign, he does so in this wonderfully 18th century gentlemanly way. He always writes letters to the commanders of the forts that he is uh, attacking. He'll send an emissary in which he, someone who, who has some knowledge of the British or who has met some of the British officers who are commanding the posts. And as is in the case with Mobile, the siege of Mobile, the officer stays to dinner and has a nice meal with the commander of the British, uh, British garrison, says, would you like to surrender? British, British guy said, no, sorry, can't, not today. Uh, call back again later. And we all go about the business of killing uh, once we've established the ground rules. Galvez is always very, very anxious to sort of make everything clear and bring everything out in the open. He wants the rules of engagement, which are not written down specifically in the 18th century. He wants the rules of engagement to be understood by both sides, which is a very interesting way of looking at things when you don't have a code to structure your campaign around. He, he prioritizes talking to the civil and military authorities about the protection of civilian land. He doesn't want them to use it against him, and he doesn't want to have to destroy it to make sure that they can't use it against him. As a result, during the siege of Pensacola, the majority of the population were allowed were quite safe and able to stay in the town because the Spanish and the British agreed not to use it as uh, the principal area of military operations. And this speaks to Galvez's inter uh, interesting quirk in Galvez's nature as a general because he's very audacious but he's also very careful about how he spends his men's lives and what he does to affect the civilian pop population. It's a really interesting way of of conducting warfare, I find, uh, of trying to establish those rules. Uh, and it comes across as very gentlemanly, which, as you said, ties in with the fact that you know he's a he's an enlightened enlightened warrior. As a there's a third party or third may bigger party in this conflict which is the the native americans you know i i've i've been to florida before you know their presence is, is starting to be the historic presence of these these groups and these tribes is starting to be more pronounced and and clearer what was their role within this particular conflict because west florida is very split in terms of spain and and britain now yeah, so for, yes, it's, it's, it's very good that you brought that up. Geographically speaking, there is a gigantic sort of void between British America and Spanish Louisiana. This is obviously not a void at all. There's a lot of people living there. This is the these are the treaty zones. This is the this is the Townsend Act uh, proclamation lines that partially sparked the American Revolution all the way from the Canadian border down to the line of West Florida and bordered by the Mississippi, as far as Louisiana, uh, sorry, as far as New Orleans. What am I talking about? No, St. Louis, as far as St. Louis. It, it, all of that land, as far as the British are concerned, to be honest, as far as the Spanish are concerned as well, is the, is the domain and the sovereign land of Native American nations. In the South, this these nations comprise the Cherokees, the uh, Muscogees, or the Creeks, as they were called, the Upper and Lower Creeks in those days, as they were called, the Chickasaws and the Choctaws. Those are the main groups. And there's also a nascent nation growing in Florida of, of Muscogee settlers that will become known as the Seminoles. And these will one day comprise what the United States uh, identifies as the five civilized tribes. Now, the, one of the biggest um, forces in action over the way that the British and the Spanish fight is that they are in some ways in the orbit of a very large Native American group that can 
put into the field at uh, at their bet on their best day two to three thousand warriors bearing in mind that at its height campbell can muster between 1500 and 2000 regulars and that galvez attacked florida on the mississippi with somewhere around 1500 men of regulars and militia and allied native americans this is a massive force of troops and you just can't go wandering around ticking them off in fact, as I mentioned earlier, Brit the British had excellent communications into these areas due to their Indian policy of, the, of a previous Indian superintendent uh, whose name was John Stewart, I believe. And so he was able to draw a large allied force to Pensacola to help defend it. From the view of the Native Americans, they would have preferred to deal with the French, most of them, but the French aren't there anymore. And because the British aped the French system of diplomacy, they think they get better deals with the British than the Spanish. And a lot of the, but this is not this is not uh, one hundred percent the feeling of everybody within those nations. There are splinter groups. There are there are contra political parties within them that prefer the Spanish or the British. But for the most part, you're getting a a pro-British stance from the majority of, of, of the Native Americans, especially the Muscogees. And there's a, an open question about the Choctaws throughout most of the period as to which side they want to side with. They, the reasons that they want to fight are essentially the reasons that anybody wants to fight or become an ally of the British, and that is that they will they will send their warriors away. The warriors will come back with loot and rewards. They'll be paid essentially to stay around as auxiliaries and their young men will be able to claim rights of manhood once they have gone into battle. It's a very cultural significant thing for a warrior to earn his manhood hunting and fighting. And so essentially a lot of the younger warriors who go out, and there were a lot of them uh, in 1780, wanted to bring back scalps as proof that they had that they were a man now and they went out under leaders like um i i i, I think i'm pronouncing his name right uh francia mistabe uh who was a a a vaunted choctaw war chief and he is the guy he is the third general of this campaign and he's the guy at Pensacola in 1781. When most of the other nations have gone home, there's around four to 600 Choctaws and Muscogees there. It's interesting to see that that powerful factor, those powerful actors playing a role within this conflict and, and throwing, on a whole, their, their weight behind one of the two sides. And it's, it's an interesting dynamic. And it's it's interesting to see it play out within your books and, and read those pints points not pints points about those uh, native warriors coming back with scalps uh, within a conflict that we don't seem to associate with practices such as that. Now, when the conflict begins and it eventually moves to face to face battles between the British and the Spanish, what happens in the face to face battle? The the sides are pretty evenly matched in terms of, of man for man, a regular for a regular. The Spanish have gone through exhaustive reforms since the 1760s and before that to keep to get their army up to scratch. They fight a lot like the French do, and the British, of course, have a very solid regular army battalion system that ensures a, a relatively good showing even if the troops are poorly sort of funded and supplied as they are in West Florida. Um, if, you, if you were to sort of characterize the actions and skirmishes throughout the siege of Pensacola, you would have to say that a mixture of the loyalist troops, who we haven't actually mentioned yet, uh, and the the Native American war bands uh, and the Royal Artillery to some extent do a good job of harassing the Spanish as they attempt to first locate a stable camp 
and then to uh, and then as they try to establish siege lines and entrenchments for their batteries, there's a lot of fighting that occurs over uh, campgrounds and entrenching grounds. And Galvez is not a general who is just going to use his superior numbers. He eventually gets superior numbers, I should say. He doesn't have them at the beginning. Um, but he's not a man to just waste his men and just say, just just dig under fire. They, because they, he knows the British have a lot of guns and he'll lose a lot of men. And he's not interested in that. He just wants to get his siege lines dug, his batteries in place, and get the science of let the science of siege warfare do its thing. And it's fairly evenly matched, to be honest. Um, you might say that it's a bit of give and take between Galvez's light infantry, which he uses a lot to try and scare off the the war bands and the 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 Native American warriors and the loyalists. And, I mean, in, in, to be honest, during the first part of the siege, uh, Francia Mustabe becomes incredibly angry with the British for not supporting him properly and that his warriors are doing all the fighting. And he's saying, there's only so much we can do if you don't come and fight with us. But it could be said that the British are not uh, aggress as aggressive as they should be uh, as a point to Francia Mustabe. And so the Spanish are never driven off but they are harassed. Even Galvez is wounded at one point. So there's a lot, it's a lot of skirmishing, a lot of the Spanish go here, they start doing this, they come under attack, the light infantry go out, there's another skirmish, the attackers melt into the woods, the Spanish draw back, sometimes they will be forced back and the Spanish will commit artillery to clearing the woods with canister shot and they move on with the rest of the siege and what they're trying to do. And then hands of the Spanish able to turn this siege uh, and defeat of small skirmishes defeat of small skirmishes into a Spanish victory. Then it's done because it's done because of that so sort of sort of lack of aggression on the part of the British, as I mentioned before. Campbell keeps a lot of his what what he has of his regular garrison back. He doesn't commit it strongly to attacking camps and and sorties and stuff like that. He only do, makes one large sortie, and that's actually a bit too late. Uh, and so the Spanish, as I said, are given a, a not untroubled, but a, a relatively free hand to select the ground they need and then to act on it, especially after Galvez's major reinforcements come in and he gets a more cooperative naval commander, uh, who is uh, Jose de Solano. And so the key for the Spanish, once they get their principal camp built, and they fortify that, is to select an area that they can attack the British fortifications from. The British fortifications are on an eminence called um, Gage Hill. There are three forts on it, and they want to attack the closest one to them, which is um, consistently called the Half Moon Redoubt, which is an engineering term from the 18th century, and in French it's the Demi Lune, or, yeah, that's why it's Half Moon. It's a crescent shaped fort. And they feel that once they take that, the other ones will topple because it's at the top of the hill. Correct. So Galvez has a lot of a lot of talented men with him. He has very able subordinates, and even when he's recovering from his wound, these men progress the siege. Uh, you know, keeping in contact with him throughout the entire thing, but they progress the siege in a logical manner. They find a difficulty trying to get those first trenches built, but eventually what they do is they 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 speed build because they have a lot of men that, who can dig the trenches. They can they can deploy thousands of men to deploy uh, to to dig these trenches, uh, and they do it at night and then fall back in the daytime when the British guns open fire. And they manage to erect a battery somewhere through uh, April. And once that battery is built and can start firing, and it actually starts drawing fire away from the place that the Spanish actually want to build, they can progress those trenches incredibly fast. And they do, so that by the beginning of May, the British are getting heavy counter fire from uh, Spanish artillery. And it is that heavy counter fire that, act that actually is the catalyst for the end of the siege. It's interesting to see, and I'm saying interesting to see quite a lot because it is really interesting, the the role of psychological warfare from de Galvez of 
and de Galvez's men of of trying to to lull the British into a false sense and, and trying to to cut their morale to to get that that victory. Now I'm going to ask you a, a political history kind of question here because I know you do like that. You know, what was the effect of a Spanish victory on the British, the Americans, and the Spanish? Because you know it's a it's a big territory. There's that there's that war revolution or civil war as the Spanish see in it, but the Spanish also have their own uh, territories, their own American empire. So that this must have an effect on that. It, it, it does in, in various ways. It's all a little indirect, though, because to be fair to those critics who say... Because people will either praise Galvez to the moon as like he won the American Revolution all by himself and he's been unrighteously, unrighteously forgotten, or they will say that um, he... He he did he was he was just back backwater. He didn't do a thing. He was just off in the middle of nowhere. It's a bit of both. So the main consequences of the siege of Pensacola are that it ends, although it's a very long siege. It ends at quite a quite an important moment. It should be said that Galvez would have much preferred to have had Pensacola taken in seventeen eighty, but there were a lot of reasons why he couldn't move fast enough to get it done. If he had got it done, then you would have seen in 1781 a very large Franco-Spanish attack on Jamaica, almost certainly. And that's what the Spanish wanted to do next. Troops, there was about 7,000 troops in Pensacola and a lot of ships now, and they were all then brought back towards Havana and New Orleans to be redistributed for uh, Allied actions with the French in the Caribbean. So that's important. You have you have the availability of the Spanish to strike wherever they want now. The, the Gulf Coast is theirs. There's, the British are no longer there. And then you have the question of Spanish money. Now, the Spanish would naturally be wanting to push money towards their active military engagements, such as the siege of Pensacola and the reconquest of the Gulf Coast. But now that that is done, it can be put elsewhere put to good use elsewhere. And as it turns out, when the King's Commissioner, Francisco de Saavedra, goes back to Havana and then goes to San Domingue to talk to Admiral de Grasse about a joint Franco-Spanish attack somewhere and how they can both progress the freedom of the United States so as to deprive British, the British ports and access to troops and such, uh, he finds out that there is a plan afoot that George Washington wants the grass to go to Virginia to trap Cornwallis, who is now wandering aimlessly around the Carolinas, chasing General Green, uh, and trap that army. The problem is de Grasse has no money. He, he can't finance the expedition. And also problematic is that he, if, if all the French ships go to Virginia, who's going to defend Saint-Domingue? Well, Saavedra logically says... Um, we have money and we have ships, so why don't you stop by Cuba on the way and I'll get you some money to get you going along and we'll send uh, Solano's squadron up to Saint-Domingue because we can't actually go and help the United States. Remember, we're neutral. We can't actually be involved in that. But we can give you shed loads of money to allow you to go. Now, uh, there's this, this crazy story about the... the the, a, a voluntary fund is got up in Havana, which raises about a million pesos, which is given to which is given to de Grasse as he passes by Cuba, and that gets him on the road. And he the, the very reason for this this fund to be suddenly collected is because the royal voluntary uh, fund for the war. That had been asked that had been got up in 1779-1780 was stuck in Veracruz. So he'd actually needed to get more money on top of that. But as fortune would have it, that roughly two million pesos that had been sitting in Veracruz came into Havana not long after de Grasse left, and so Saavedra forwarded that forwarded that to the French army under Rochambeau at um, at least a million of it anyway, uh, who is obviously uh, operating in Virginia. So there's a big argument to be made that if the Spanish are still operating roughly their, their own deal, 
1781, for the rest of 1781, there may not have been the, the flexibility to get that money to the French. And if the French can't get that money, then the ships can't sail, and George Washington won't go down to Virginia and the Carolinas, and you don't get Yorktown. In terms of actual politics, the importance of the capture of Pensacola in West Florida is essentially that now the British don't have a, another bargaining chip to give away in return for something else. And it technically allows the Spanish to start planning for an attack on Jamaica, which doesn't materialize because the war ends at the end of, effectively at the end of 1781. Um, and realistically, the next year. But the fight, proper fighting kind of ends after Yorktown, the big fighting, we'll, we'll call it. But had it not ended, you have to remember that the Spanish have just secured the entire Gulf Coast, and the Mississippi runs right up into the United States territory. So a massive commercial artery has just been opened to friendly ports, to neutral ports, from where supplies and money and traders can bypass the British blockade on the Atlantic. So if the war had progressed, this was a really, really big deal, actually, to the ongoing war effort. That it didn't, that the war ended when it did, nobody knew it was going to end when it did. So it's, it's important, but it's, it's, sort of, um, it's, it's sort of oblique at the same time. Uh, there's a, almost a, a butterfly effect importance in in taking Pensacola and winning that. But then, you know, it's that counterfactual history. If this had happened, then this would have been way more important. But if it hadn't happened, then it wouldn't have been. Which is which is always I love it, counterfactual history. I love political history. And it's always it's always great to explore those possibilities. But that's probably for another podcast, Josh. <laughs> so I have a final fun question for you as we do for all the guests here. You've had a couple already, so you know the drill. You've been involved, and I'm sure if you follow Josh on, on Twitter and Instagram now, you'd see that Josh has been involved in an awful lot of exciting writing projects this year. Now, it, I, I know it's a bit like asking a mother to choose her favourite child, but which has been your favourite one to be involved in this year, Josh? Hmm. Uh, I think it would have to. I think it has to be this book because uh, I'm very pleased with what we were able to bring to readers. I'm very happy with the first-hand accounts and some of the Native American perspectives we were able to get in there, which I didn't think we were going to get. Uh, and I'm, I was delighted to be able to work with uh, Krista Hook on the, on the cover and even Don Troiani through a weird um, association of friends to get some of his pictures in there as well. So it would have to be this book. I, this is this. I mean, it was always going to be this book was going to be the, the principal work of this year. Uh, I had a lot of fun with with many other projects, but um, yeah, it would have to be every hazard and fatigue is the is the highlight of the year. I think I think that's a great answer. Uh, and even having commissioned you in a couple of pieces for for different places, you know, I I definitely agree. Even though they were fantastic, this is this is certainly the crowning jewel of your of your year. So congratulations for that, Josh. Thank you so much, Jackson. It was really That's nice right. to come back. No, not, well, of course, Josh. People are going to want to find you, grab a copy of this book, watch your work, listen to your work, uh, and read some more of your work. Where can they go? Where can they buy a copy of this book? You can buy it from Helion, the Helion website. Uh, weirdly, it's 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 coming into stock and then disappearing from stock on Amazon. So, which I mean is, is, is nice. I don't know what's going on there, but uh, yes, you can buy it on Amazon if it's in stock. And uh, you can find me on Twitter. I will not use the other name because it doesn't make sense. Uh, as um, uh, at Land of History. And you can find me on YouTube still, uh, Adventures in History Land. The blog is still going massively neglected as well uh, adventures in history land if you find find me on one you'll find me on the others and and that it is a great platform josh and i encourage other people to go and watch your stuff read your stuff uh, and grab a copy of this book because you know, it's a really great piece of book and it opens great piece of book great book that opens up so many narratives that we need to open up so thank you very much josh thank you jackson that's right and a link for your book will be in the description so thank you very much for coming on 
Thank you very much for listening to this newest episode of the History of Jackson podcast, where we spoke to author Joshua Proven about his brand new book with Helion, Every Hazard and Fatigue, The Siege of Pensacola, 1781. Now, I'm sure we can all agree Josh was awesome when we learned so much history about something we probably haven't heard about before, which is what we love to do here at History of Jackson. Now, if you enjoy listening and learning about history you don't often come across, do please consider heading to the Buy Me A Coffee profile in the description below or subscribing to History of Jackson Plus on Apple Podcasts. That will allow you to support History of Jackson and allow us to continue to do what we do every week, every day, and continue to deliver high-quality, accessible, digestible history content to you. So I will speak to you all next week in our special Christmas episode.